Welcome to a Video Tours exclusive, a dawn to dusk, behind the scenes, VIP visit to the world's most famous zoo, the San Diego Zoo. Barbara, how are you? Oh, you're so wide awake. Morning, Gordy. Well, I see you're stuck in your seconds. It's hours before the first visitors arrive. Can you hand me this morning? A time for morning greetings and the day's Hi. first meal. at these animals and they see an animal that sleeps up to 20 hours a day and it's kind of difficult to recognize that an animal that sleeps that much can actually have a personality but they really do they're very unique animals too and so they're really fascinating they're actually marsupials rather than bears um, a lot of times people call them bears um, that probably originated because they look sort of like teddy bears A head of lettuce and just throwing in a banana. We put the bowl in front of each elephant, they eat it, you have to make sure that they don't eat the bowl as well, and then they're ready to go out for the morning. Some people consider me like a female lioness with these elephants because I am very defensive about them and I don't want people to take them for granted. They're very special animals and they're also extremely sensitive animals. In the old days people used to think that in order to get control over an elephant or gain dominance over them you had to have muscle but it's not true at all. Obviously I don't have the muscle but they're sensitive animals and you can relate to them on that way. You can have a common bond with them and that's the best part about working with elephants. We have uh, over 420 species of birds, 1,800 individuals, which takes a, a lot of constant care and a lot of attention, a lot of observation time. We try to design exhibits to best mimic the natural setting of the animal, to take into consideration the reproductive needs of the animal, the dietary needs of the animal. So now, instead of the old cement and wire, we look at cement, wire, and everything else. And everything else is the, is the, is the, the trick. The philosophy is trying to balance the need of the public, the viewing public, with the need of the animal. It was the presence of these animals that first sparked the idea of a San Diego Zoo. A collection left over from the 1916 World's Fair, the animals faced an uncertain future until the roar of a lion captured the attention and the imagination of a passing motorist, Dr. Harry Wagaforth. He was uh, going downtown with his brother Paul. My dad commented, he said, somebody ought to start a zoo. And Paul said, why don't you? And that was the gist of it. And start a zoo he did. Dr. Harry, recognized today as one of the pioneers of the modern zoos in America, formed what is now the largest non-profit zoological society in the world, and the zoological park that continues to enchant millions of visitors every year. 
left baggage, two adults, two children. Bus, nursery, sky ride both ways, and a map of the park. Thank you. Bye-bye. Arrivals are a major event at the zoo for the animals and people. This is the first day for these Chinese bears to be on exhibit. Now, as you can see, they're very anxious to make their debut here at the San Diego Zoo. They've been in quarantine for the past month. So you kids get out there and knock them dead, okay? four years to get these bears here. Anytime you have a cub or a new bears going on the exhibit, it is very exciting. Whether they're new arrivals from afar or long-standing favorites, all bears are expert crowd pleasers. some crickets for you today. Great. In addition to 700,000 crickets, the zoo's elegant dining selection includes 20 tons of bananas, 150,000 pounds of seafood, 60 tons of meat, plus other delicacies, such as over a million mealworms, and that's just a fraction of the zoo's annual grocery list. There's mealworms, there's ground dog food with chow chow, a mixture of seed. As you can see, their food is kind of squishy, so they do get the hard bone to chew on to keep those pearly whites nice and clean and sharp. Each panda gets a cup of this a day. If you were a health food nut, you could probably eat it yourself because it contains everything in it that you would ever need. And it tastes good. It does. <laughs> the quality you see there, uh, here is what we get every day. We get it shipped in twice a week uh, to keep it fresh and make sure it's turned over. It's the same quality you get at home. now. This gives you a look at the backs of the cages that the keepers work while the visitors are here seeing the zoo. The windows that the visitors look through are at the front of the cage and the big double doors are at the back of the cage so that the keeper can reach in and work on these animals and do the things that he needs to do. The Fiji Island Iguana is an endangered species and we're very fortunate here at the zoo that we actually have bred them and raised up a couple of their young. We keep very accurate specimen histories on each one of our animals. Every animal has its own card where we keep a record of where it's at, what the temperature is in its cage, what kind of plants are in the cage, what kind of soil, what it's eating. 
every three months we weigh these animals so that we can keep good track of what their weight is doing. If it starts losing weight, then we know that we need to either change its diet or the amount of diet it gets, or we need to consult a veterinarian. With reptiles, they don't show symptoms like mammals and birds do. They don't sneeze and uh, get droopy-eyed and, and look sick. And so we have to use the weight to do that. When you're working with something dangerous, the trick is knowing what you're doing. If you're experienced and you've been taught properly, you're not taking any chances. For some reason, possibly unexplainable, I found these animals so interesting. Maybe because they were so unusual and because they were so misunderstood. And the more I studied them, the more fascinating and wonderful that I uh, thought they were. And uh, I've been working with them ever since. It used to be that uh, when people wanted another giraffe or another uh, rhinoceros, they could simply go to the wild. They could buy them animal from an animal dealer who obtained it from the wild. Now that's no longer the case. In the last year, just the last year, half the rhinoceroses on the planet have disappeared. They're disappearing entirely. If they're going to persist, something is going to have to be done. Zoos, for some of these species, may be able to play a role, a small role in preserving some species so that they can be reintroduced to habitats in the future. The Chevalsky horse behind me here is an example. This is a species that's extinct in the wild. If the species is going to persist on our planet, uh, we're going to have to breed it successfully because all the Chevalsky horses in the world come from only 13 animals that came from the wild. We have to be very careful about the breeding of these animals so that we don't get them unnecessarily inbred and so that we avoid genetic diseases and factors like this. And this is true for many other species besides the Chevalsky horse. The zoo's hospital complex houses the important work of a team of researchers, veterinarians and animal keepers. We have probably the most diverse, multi-talented program of any zoo in the world bringing scientific disciplines to bear on the needs of these animals. I'm director of research uh, in the Center of Reproduction of Endangered Species, which is the zoo's research department, which aims to get all the knowledge necessary to establish self-sustaining populations of endangered species in captivity, with the hope that ultimately we return some of these animals to the wild, provided there is a wild preserved habitat for them. We interact, of course, with the curators and with the clinical veterinarians. The curators will actually provide us access to the animals. If we're investigating infectious disease problems, the veterinarians are the first to bring these to our attention. And then also, again, provide us the sample materials necessary in the laboratory to identify the disease in question, which is causing a pro health problem. What's the scenario going to be in the, you know, for the hospital? This one? We've got the spring buck to do first, then the munchak, and then the pygmy and chimps two after chimps that. Coming up after that. Okay, and the deal with those guys is just regular processing because you know, we want to give them their physical exams and TB test them and uh, take some specimens for some investigative studies for mycobacterial infections. These are lion-tailed macaques which come from India and it's one of the most endangered of the macaque species. There are probably only about a thousand of them left in existence in the wild. There are several zoos that have them in captive breeding programs and we're one of them and I think we have one of the largest collections of any in captivity. One lion-tailed macaque offers an inspiring example of human and animal determination. Um, Kim is three years old and he has cerebral palsy. Um, he lived with his mother for about 13 months and then we had to separate him from his mom because she was nursing him and her milk was no longer nutritious enough to sustain him. And we started hand feeding him and we still do that. We hand feed him twice a day. Um, he's doing quite well. During the time that we've been hand feeding him, he's gained about three and a half pounds. 
in the wild, an animal like Kim, an animal diagnosed with cerebral palsy, would not survive. Uh, Kim cannot climb, and in the wild, these animals spend about 80% of their time in the trees. So just the fact that he couldn't climb would definitely have killed him. And we have physical therapists who come in and work with him. We also do exercises with him in an attempt to get him to move better. When we first pulled him away from his mom, he couldn't even use his back legs. He simply dragged them behind him. And now he can walk as well as run. So one of the things that we've done for Kim is we've built this special ramp in the cage. This ramp starts down at the bottom and goes up to the nest box, which is a sleeping area for the animals at night. And Kim now can climb up and sleep with the animals in the nest box. He gets along quite well socially in the group. I, I think on some level they sense that he has a handicap. The other animals respect him. What the public sees is us cleaning up the yard, but when we're trying to train them to do a new thing, even just bathing them and trimming their feet, that's the really interesting part about keeping animals, and the public sees none of it. We have to take care of their feet first and foremost. And captive elephants don't walk anywhere near as far as wild elephants, so they don't get the natural wear and tear on the feet. These are the nails of the elephant's rear feet. and. Uh, cuticles where the sweat glands are are real important to keep them clean, not, not overgrown and not dirty and not rotten, of course. Keep the nails high and keep them flat, clean. I'm trimming off some of the excess pads. It gets a little, a few holes in it and it starts to get debris build up there. So we trim it down so it's nice and flat. Use a big heavy wood rasp on the nails. Keep them trimmed up. I got to know the keepers and the elephants themselves and I realized what an intelligent animal they were. And I was extremely intrigued by that and also the fact that they are one of the very few animals in the zoo that keepers have direct contact with. And that's what I get out of it. The more time I spend, the closer the relationship I form with these animals, the neater it is for me. And it makes the job extremely enjoyable. There's a lot of keepers that do things on their own time, that uh, they're committed to animal health and welfare. That's what we're here for, to make their day better. While we're here, we do the best we can to make it different and exciting and a nice place to be. What we've got here is holes drilled in the log, which they have to use their fingers or sticks to work on to get the sunflower seeds and raisins, which lengthens the time that it takes for them to eat their food. If they're eating, they're not bored. It's basically what these animals would be doing if they were in the wild, would be foraging, which is looking for food and eating. So this is just one way that we can come close to attempting to duplicate the situation as it would be for them if they were living in the wild. My closest attachment has been with some of the gorillas and some of the orangs some time back. Alvila, the, the female that's over there now, I gave her her first bottle back in the 60s when she was born. After she was born, I went over to the children's zoo that night and they had a little, little bit of liquid that wanted me to get down her. And uh, she started to go to sleep, I'd pinch her foot just a little bit. She'd wake up and take a couple of drinks and go to sleep and i work through the night that way. And by the time the children's zoo person come in the next morning, she'd taken her fluid. Well, I kind of feel close to Alvila. You know. First one I saw when I started working here was his mother, and she was two. I've waited 20 years for this. I think he's pretty good. Over here, okay? 
you can't help but feel like a mom. <laughs> you know, you're here every day, of, you know, five days a week for how many years, a number of years, and you, you can't help but take care and wonder how they're doing, if they're doing well, and you, that attachment, that, that fondness that you have for your animals your, in your care can't help but make you have that maternal feeling, whether you're male or female. There's a lot of times I go through the zoo and a week will go by and I, I think to myself, you know, I haven't even noticed any animals around me because I don't pay attention to the animals as much. Just as spectacular and exotic as the zoo's animals are its more than 7,000 species of plants collected from around the world since the zoo's earliest days. During the 30s, uh, Dr. Harry made, I think, three trips around the world and then a complete trip of South America. And he collected seeds on all of these trips and came back and uh, brought them back to the zoo. A lot of these things wouldn't grow. Some of them didn't, but a lot of them did. So that's why we have uh, the start of the botanical collection that's in the zoo. A copy is a rock outcropping. It's from the uh, grass area of you know, Central Africa. So there are certain animals that live in that type of environment. We've taken the same type of plant life that would be in that uh, in a copy and adapted to this exhibit here. Like the African copy, more and more zoo exhibits in the future will combine plants, mammals, birds, and reptiles in complete environments that replicate their native habitats. The Egyptians used to have collections of animals, and, uh, and zoos have been a part of uh, man's society for thousands of years. And today, it's, it's the only way that uh, that our children can see the animals that live in the world. And he is the only albino koala that's ever been born in captivity. There's only one other albino, and she is in Australia, and she was born in the wild. So he's a real special animal. plan and they can get out so we take them in in the evening. We're outside the uh, Southeast Asian Langer building which is where we exhibit our langers during the day. At night, which is what I do in late lockup, is uh, bring the animals in and have them eat their dinner, make sure they're okay, and lock them up, which is upstairs. And uh, in the morning, if the other keeper comes in and lets them out during the day into the uh, exhibit where the people can also observe them. It's a privilege to be able to have a part to play in preserving an animal as magnificent as the Pshavalsky horse or as a tapir or as a gorilla or orangutan or any, almost any of the species you can see here at the zoo. These are part of the, the treasure of biological resources of our planet and they've been on the verge of extinction and now they're coming back and the, you know, the, the most fantastic thing would be able to participate in seeing that they go back into nature. That's really, that's really uh, one of the big goals. The 
without uh, zoos and without uh, game preserves, certain animals will disappear. Uh, because uh, I believe in some years to come, there really won't be wild animals. They will be managed in some way or other. Um, I like to be part of that. The world to me would be a very, very lonely place if we were the only species inhabiting it. And at the rate of extinction of species, which is about one a day right now, and by the year 2000, maybe one a minute, and those are rather accurate pro uh, projections, uh, we might be the last species, and, and indeed then we may in ourselves be in jeopardy as our habitats become so imperiled by human activity. We have a tremendous opportunity to allow people to see the diversity, the wonders of the different types of life that exist on this planet, and thereby, we hope, to let them come to appreciate this more and to participate more actively in saving the wildlife, saving the forms of plants and animals that are in danger on our planet. visitors have gone, and life at the zoo continues. The night provides a quiet passage to another day's adventures. Good morning. 